So cancer touches us all. I suspect that everyone in this room in one way or another has been affected by cancer, in a loved one, in a friend, maybe even yourself. So when I refer to the phone call, I'm pretty sure that all of you can appreciate what I'm referring to. I was working as a medical oncologist in Boston, Massachusetts when I got the phone call from my mother, who was living in Berkeley, California at the time. They had done a mammogram, and they had found a lesion, and she was obviously very concerned about it. My mother's cancer story is not unlike a lot of women at that time, and really to the, at this time as well. She had surgery. They found an advanced tumor. It had spread to 17 positive lymph nodes. We managed to get her on a clinical trial where she got a lot of high-dose chemotherapy. And I believe to this day that we had cured her body of the cancer. But unfortunately, breast cancer is one of those forms of cancer that can spread to the brain. And the brain resides in a place that's somewhat protected from the bloodstream and where drugs can't always reach. And so a couple of years later, my sister noticed that some of the sentences my mother were saying were not exactly, didn't make sense. And when I called my mother, she wasn't the sharp, articulate English teacher that I had known all my life. And I managed to convince her medical oncologist to get a brain scan where they found, in fact, there was tumor. And even despite radiation therapy and surgery, she eventually succumbed to her cancer at the age of 64. Cancer is a challenging problem. We've gotten very good at managing a lot of diseases. If you look at, at uh, changes uh, that in death rates due to specific diseases, you can see that we've gotten very good at treating heart disease between 1950 and the turn of this century. We've gotten good at managing stroke. We've gotten good at managing infectious diseases. But cancer still remains a major problem. So it might surprise you to know that I'm actually optimistic. And in order for me to explain to you why I'm optimistic, let me tell you a little bit about what cancer is. Now, in the simplest of terms, cancer is a disease where our own cells go bad. They essentially attack us. Now, there are two key characteristics that make a cancer cell a cancer cell. The first thing is that cancer cells multiply out of control. In the adult human, we have a relatively stable number of cells in our body. Now, perhaps if we get wounded, our cells will start to divide to fill in the wound. But once they fill in that wound, signals are sent out, and the cells obey those signals, and they stop dividing again. But cancer cells never stop dividing. They just continue to, to go indefinitely. A second key characteristic of cancer cells is that they go to places where they don't belong. So these are images of an individual who has widespread cancer. Wherever you see a dark white spot, you're looking at cancer that has left the original tumor and gone somewhere else in the body, much like the tumor in my mother that went to her brain. So why be optimistic? Well, we've learned a lot in the last few decades about how to manage this disease and how to understand it. Back when I went to medical school, doctors made the diagnosis of cancer by looking at the cells under a microscope. The microscope was the dominant tool of our research and also of our diagnosis. Here what you see is a, a slice of normal breast. You can see that it's organized in these very nice, these nice structures here, um, single layer of cells that secrete milk into this lumen here and eventually travel out the duct. So this is a very organized architecture, the way our body was meant to be. And this is what it looks like in cancer. Now you see all of these sort of disorganized cells all over the place, dividing out of control, not behaving themselves. And this form of diagnosis is still very relevant today. Doctors still use this. But we've added to that. So we've gone from what I would call the age of cells, where we looked at the shapes of cells, to what I would now call the age of molecules. Because now we can look within those cells at the specific molecules that make those cells. Each color you see here represents a different type of protein that's doing something else in those cells. And by understanding what those proteins and molecules are doing, we can take what was once a single diagnosis and now understand it to be multiple different subtypes of, of cancer, each one responding to a different type of drug, and each one attaching a different type of prognosis. One thing we absolutely know about cancer is that the earlier we catch this disease, the better chance we have of curing it. Here you see death rates 
or really survival rates based on the, on the stage of diagnosis. And stage is really a way of saying how early did we catch it. Patients with, stage, with early stage disease like stage one have a very good outcome, whereas patients with later stage disease have a much more challenging time. Now we have tools that help us catch this disease early. Perhaps the most commonly, one, commonly known one is mammography. This is a mammogram of a breast, and you can see the yellow arrow is pointing to a suspicious lesion. Mammography is fantastic. It has saved many, many lives, but it has its limitations. It's often not available. There are countries all over the world that don't have mammography available for women. Even when it is available, it misses up to a quarter of all cancers. And oftentimes, in fact, four out of five times, mammography finds something that really isn't cancer, and women end up with a lot of angst and often surgeries that they don't need. So we thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could come up a way to supplement mammography with a blood test? Could we find a blood test that would help us identify cancer? And in order to think about how we went about this, we go back to the molecules. Now, I'm sure all of you remember that you know, we, we, we have DNA. DNA is the genetic material that we inherited from our parents. And DNA is basically a blueprint that tells our cells how to make incredibly important molecules in our body called proteins. Proteins are the components that make us. They are the bricks and mortar of us, and they are also the machines that operate all of the functions of our body. When we get sick, it is almost the always the result of protein malfunction, and virtually every drug we take either acts by altering protein activity, or these days is itself a protein. So we knew that cancers make bad proteins, and we wondered, could these bad proteins lead us back to the cancers? So to explain how we went about this, let's, let's take a little mind experiment. Imagine that all of these people represent different proteins, each person a different protein. There are tens of thousands of different proteins in our body. And among this crowd of proteins, there are some bad proteins, proteins, criminals, if you will, that are leading us to cancer. So we're going we're gonna to take some kind of a video surveillance system. We're going to do facial recognition. And we're going to see if we can identify a pattern among the bad guys, if you will, all right? So we're going to start by assuming everybody's innocent, and then we're going to compare these faces against mug shots that we have stored in a database somewhere that relates to cancer proteins. And as we do this, a certain pattern arises. And I'm going to ask you all, can you see the pattern that's arising? What is it? Sunglasses, right. In this case, a number of sunglasses. But there's a little trick here, and that is that sometimes um, you pick up things that are false positives. When you do this kind of a screen, you get a bunch of things that look suspicious but turn out not to really be the bad guys. And so the key is you have to repeat this experiment a number of times to make sure that you really get the true positives. And when you do that, you get down to a, a, a much smaller number. And now can you tell me the pattern that really leads to cancer here? Red sunglasses, exactly. Okay, so, so now let's, let's think about how this works molecularly. It turns out in our bodies, we have a surveillance system, and they're called antibodies. These are molecules that are floating in our bloodstream, specifically looking for things that don't belong. And there are hundreds of thousands of different antibodies in our blood. And whenever an antibody encounters something that doesn't belong, it binds to it, and it sends out two important signals. The first signal is it tells the body to attack whatever it's bound to. So if it, if it encounters a cancer protein on a cancer cell, it's going to tell the body to come and get it. The second thing it does is it sends up a signal to make more copies of that same antibody. Now, that's just the same way that if the police were aware of a criminal acting in a particular area, they may, might make multiple copies of the mugshots and distribute them to post offices and businesses to alert people that this particular criminal was acting in that area. We had the idea that if, if we could look in a person's body, and if they were making a lot of antibodies against a cancer protein, that might, be a, that might be a signal that that person had a cancer operating in their body. In other words, the presence of those antibodies might tell us that that person might have cancer. So we needed two things to find these. The first thing is we needed a source of antibodies that were specific to cancer. And of course, we could get that from cancer patients. And the second thing was we needed a way to display all the different possible proteins, just like the image of all those different people, to see which ones the antibodies were recognizing. And so we actually invented this technology here. This is a protein microarray. It's a glass chip. And I'm not sure if you can appreciate the little tiny spots on the chip right there. Each of those spots represents a different protein. 
And the idea was to take the blood from patients with cancer, put them on this array, and see which proteins they stuck to. Now, it was tricky to make an array like this, and to do that, we had to rely on what we knew about molecules. You can't just easily just pick proteins out of, out of cells. You have to make them. And so we, we relied on the fact that the DNA is the genetic blueprint. So we took that DNA, and we made copies of each different gene in the genome, and we printed each one separately as a different spot. So all those little green spots you see, each one represents the gene for a different protein. We added an extract and then converted that DNA into the proteins themselves. And we ended up with a glass chip that had thousands of spots on it, each one representing a different protein. Now we were ready to do the experiment. We took, first of all, the blood from healthy women, and we got a sense of what the background was like. And then we took the blood from patients with cancer, and now suddenly certain spots started to light up. And here you can see these different spots that are lighting up. Now, those are suspicious cancer proteins, but they may not be cancer proteins. We have to repeat the experiment several times to make sure that we rule out all the false positives. And we did that. We did the same experiment three different times. The third time, we did it blinded, so we didn't know which samples were the cancer patients and which ones were the healthy patients. In the end, we identified a couple of dozen different markers specific for cancer, and we ended up licensing those out to a diagnostics company that put them into the first CLIA-certified blood test for breast cancer. Thank you. So they have since tested that in several clinical trials uh, in around about 1,000 women. Um, they, they, between the blood test and the mammography, which they did together, they identified all the cancers. And they also reduced the biopsy rate by a considerable amount. So we're actually quite encouraged by the possibility of this. Of course, there's still research to be done, but we think it's the first step. So one of the things that most encourages us is that this is a technique that could be applied to virtually any cancer. During, during the early course of my mother's therapy, I had a long conversation with the surgeon who operated on her. And he pointed out to me that after they looked at the mammogram that had identified my mother's cancer, they went back to the mammogram that had been taken from her two years earlier. And when they looked really carefully at the old mammogram, indeed, they could see a darkening area right where the tumor ended up coming out. Of course, at that time, it was not dark enough for them to have made the call. But it does make me wonder if at that time they had a blood test that they could have done together with ma that mammogram. Would, is it possible that they would have made a call a little bit earlier? Would we have had a little bit more time to, to operate, to, to do the surgery, do the chemotherapy, and prevent the spread of the disease? We'll never know the answer to that, but I'm at least hopeful that this kind of tool is what's going to change the way we treat cancer in the future, and that is why I'm optimistic. Thank you very much. <laughs>